Hello everyone, this is the Geek Narrator and this is the first episode in the JVM internal series. In this series, we are going to look at what exactly the JVM is, why it is so powerful, what are some of the basic concepts involved, how does it work internally, and what does it exactly provide you. So with this, let's get started. In this first episode, we are going to cover the basics and create sort of a foundation on top of which we can build next episodes and understand more deeper concepts. And also some of the practical implications of using JVM for your application. What is the trend? Where is JVM going? And also some practical insights into how you can tune JVM parameters for your own applications. But that is for later. And in this episode, we will look at the really basics. It's more or less a revision of the JVM components, internals, and some of its features. So let's get started. What is a JVM? It's an abstract computing machine. And like an abstract computing machine, it has some instruction set and it manipulates some memory areas depending on the instruction set and the program you're executing. Now I know there are some words that I've used already, which is an instruction set and memory areas and all of that, but don't worry about it. We'll get to it quickly in this episode. Now what does JVM enables us to do, it enables platform independence. And by platform, we mean hardware and OS, the operating system and the hardware. So the JVM has a specification, which we'll talk a bit about later, but it doesn't assume that you are running on a special hardware or a specific operating system. And it's really abstract and it's not really prescriptive in that sense and you write a JVM dependent on the platform. And that's what makes it write once and run anywhere. And we'll get to it in a more deeper sense as to what it exactly means. This abstract machine has a specification, the Java virtual machine specification. As you can see here, we have the latest edition and I totally and I highly recommend everyone who is working on the JVM to read this specification, at least some parts of it, because it's nicely written, uh, you will understand how it doesn't go really into those implementation details and so on. And it's an interesting read. So I would definitely recommend you all to read that. Now the Java virtual machine has a specification. It's not really prescriptive. And there are multiple Im implementations like the hotspot one, which is really gaining a lot of popularity these days, open G9. <clears throat> and we'll talk about how these things differ in later episodes. Here, the JVM actually provides a runtime environment for your application and makes it easier for also the developer. So the developer doesn't have to think about the lower level details about, let's say, the memory management and the garbage collection, the concurrency and the hardware and operating system specifics. So you don't have to worry about that because the JVM covers those for you. And that's why it is abstract because it provides that abstraction layer on top of the underlying hardware. And so JVM gives you the runtime environment. It executes something called as a byte code and it manages the runtime data areas, which means where the data is stored at the runtime. It also supports multiple threads of execution. Now we'll get to understand what exactly is a thread when it comes to JVM based threads and you know what it means, what are the different memory areas does it use? We'll get to that, but these are the basics. So it executes bytecode, it manages runtime data areas, and it supports multiple threads of execution. And to be honest, concurrency is one of the uh, strongest parts when it comes to J JVM because it provides you so much. Of course, there are some gotchas or some internal details that you must be aware of while implementing some of those concurrency structures and using the locks and avoiding some problems or common bad patterns, but we'll get to that in later episodes. Next. What is a bytecode? We use the term bytecode and it's basically an intermediate representation of your source code, which is the, the language that you use for writing your code. For example, here, Java source code, which is like a simple class just for demonstration purpose. It has a number, it has basic constructor and a simple function. And But how does it get converted for the JVM to understand? So JVM doesn't know anything about the Java language. and it, it sounds a bit weird, but really JVM doesn't know anything about the Java language itself. It knows about a certain binary format, which is the class file, which contains the byte code. And this is how it looks like. So it has for each 
constructs. So in this case, for example, a constructor, it has these sets, set of instructions and it knows how to understand these instructions. And this is how, if you try to uh, look inside the class file, this is how it looks like, but these are really instructions and it's a binary format. Similarly for this function at 10, you have some instructions like what exactly the computation is required. And it's just that, that the JVM, again, the JVM doesn't know anything about your Java language, right? It knows about this intermediate representation, which is the bytecode. Now, why is it called a bytecode? Because every instruction is represented using a single byte. And why use the bytecode? Because it is runnable on any machine with a JVM. So if you have a JVM for a specific hardware and operating system for your platform, you can run your code or let's say your byte code on, the, on that machine. So it really opens up a lot of platforms for you to not think about what exactly the hardware or the operating system is going to be when you write code, but you can code in a consistent manner and expect consistent behavior across platforms, right? Because all the bytecode representation is going to be the same. The JVM is working as per a specification and it is going to treat the bytecode in a similar fashion. Of course, it will try to optimize certain things. It will try to do certain things based on the underlying hardware and the operating system. But for you, it won't matter because you are writing at a higher level of abstraction. It also provides security because in this binary format, Java has some strong syntactic checks that you need to follow when some something is generating a class file, it has to be in a certain format. And that really ensures that you cannot just run any random code, which is insecure, which may result into inconsistent behavior and all the, those sort of problems. Bytecode verification is done and that's what provides the security. And including all of these features, like you can run on any platform, you can expect a consistent behavior across platforms in a secure manner that helps you make sure that you write your code once you don't have to repeat the coding process for different platforms multiple times so you have to just write it once and you can run it anywhere if you have the jvm for that particular platform and most probably you have jvm for i don't know handle devices like really small devices you have for web servers you have different platforms supported by the jvm and it understands the bytecode so you are covered there why is it called a bytecode we already covered it because each instruction as i said initially bytecode has is represented in set of instructions jvm has this instruction sets so jvm specifies what are the instruction set it is supporting and then each instruction is represented as one byte and that's the reason it is called bytecode now bytecode has an instruction set and what are these instructions if you look at these broad classifications it's used for data manipulation. Of course, if you're doing some computation, you need to manipulate some data, right? Like update a variable, update a reference, or add some properties to your objects and so on. There's a lot of logic going on. So you need to transfer control from one function to another, one instruction to another, and so on. So there are specialized instructions for that. And then object creation, because of course you need to, you know, encapsulate some behavior inside an object, for example, and you need to create that object in the first place. And then creating object itself is a big deal because you need to allocate some memory and you, you need to manipulate the object can also grow. So you need to ensure that there is enough memory. So there's a lot of things that going on that goes on behind the scenes and the JVM nicely abstract away all those complexities for you. Method invocation, of course, like you, you need to invoke method and not only the non-native, that is the Java methods, but also you can invoke native methods and native by native, we mean the platform level uh, specific methods, for example, calling a C library or some Unix kernel level functions and so on, you can do that. So th those are native function calls that are also supported. There are specific instructions for that. Now, whenever you write code, there are some problems. There is some uh, state that your program cannot handle. And that's when it is wrapped inside exceptions and you know how to deal with those exceptions, how to return that exception to the higher level and you know how to handle them, how to handle the control flow when there is an exception. So there are some instructions that specifically handles exception. And last but not the least, synchronization, because you need to make sure, first of all, it's a concurrent environment. There are multiple threads of execution. These threads share memory. And when you have access to the shared memory, you need to synchronize, otherwise you lose you know, data, you lose consistency, there is race condition, there's all sorts of problem that is really difficult or let's say impossible to debug when things happen. 
in a multi-threaded environment, right? So these are the high classes of instructions that your bytecode can represent, and each instruction is one byte. Look at the instruction set. Um, <clears throat> there is an opcode for each of these instruction sets, and for each of the data type, it has a separate instruction. If you look at if you look at this closely, the first letter represents what kind of uh, the data type is, and for what. So let's say iconst means it is working on an integer type of data. And if it's not integer, then it's a problem. It's not valid instruction or the data is not valid or something like that. So it <clears throat> has a prefix attached to it like lconst, lstore, it stores a long value and so on for a reference. By reference here, we mean a pointer, something similar to a pointer, not exactly a pointer, but let's say something similar to a pointer that points to a memory location and then points to an object in this case, for example. So these are the data types, like the primitive ones, and there are some instructions, and of course, objects are supported, and so on. So this is an instruction set that the bytecode supports. Now, bytecode is wrapped inside your class file, and the class file is this binary format where your when you compile your Java code, or any code that can be converted into class file, represented, represented as uh, bytecode instructions, JVM can run it. So that's the reason multiple languages can run on the JVM because they can compile to a class file. Now the class file consists of a single class file structure. This is how, these are the different types of things that are available, like different type of data, identify how, what this specific class represents, what are the instructions. For example, it has some minor and major version, uh, constant pool count, and then the constant pool array itself, some of the access flag, the, the current instance, the parent instance for inheritance and so on, interfaces that it implements, fields counts, methods count, and this is like the metadata that talks about a specific class file. And that is validated, right? It's, it all, it has a syntax, it has a type, and it has validation. It, it verifies that the, the class file content is correct, otherwise it cannot run. We will look at the class file structure specifically in detail, but in upcoming episodes. But for now, let's understand that bytecode is wrapped inside or contained inside the class file. Anything that you can convert into a valid class file format with bytecode instructions, you can run it on the JVM. And that's why I said the JVM does not know anything about the Java programming language itself, but it knows about how to make it work when it comes to bytecode, how to provide a runtime environment and how to interpret or understand what's going on in the bytecode instructions. Moving on, now how is the bytecode executed? So at runtime, there are basically two parts. One, you can, the bytecode can be interpreted by the JVM itself. So at the runtime, it just try to understand what instruction it is, executes, manipulates data, areas, and so on. So it's more or less interpreted at the runtime. Part two is where it is compiled into machine code by the just-in-time compiler and it runs as a native application. For example, the Graal VM can compile your code or your source language into bytecode and then it can convert or create an image that is natively supported and it can run as a native application. Just-in-time just, just in time compiler, as I, as I just said, it combines the power of ahead-of-time compilation and interpretation and it, it's really powerful. And we'll, we'll talk differently, we'll, we'll definitely talk more about just-in-time compiler, the different available uh, options you have. And <clears throat> for example, during execution, it can also convert it or compile it to machine code or it can also directly use uh, source code translation. But compiling from bytecode to machine code is a more common uh, use case, but it can also support source code translation, which is really powerful. But again, this is just a general flow, how your uh, source code gets compiled or gets converted to bytecode, then how it gets compiled into machine code, or it can be interpreted directly at runtime, which is the path one, and you know how just-in-time compiler helps you. We'll also get to understand what is the benefit of compiling it down into machine code or let's say building it as a native application. What are the performance implications and what are the benefits of that? But in later section, this is just that we are building the foundation of the series so we can all make sense of the more advanced concepts when we reach there. And how are the languages supported, right? Like you, if you have seen, like we support Scala, Kotlin, Groovy, Clojure, and as I said, anything that can be compiled into the bytecode format that, under, that is understood by the JVM, it can run it. And JVM doesn't care if it is Java, Kotlin, Groovy, whatever. If you have bytecode, 
done. It can run it. Now, the key responsibilities, which are really important for us to understand here, that the JVM does memory management, right? It allocates memory. It makes sure that there is enough memory. And it makes sure that if there is no enough memory, it can throw some exceptions and make sure that you are aware that this is why it fails, like out of memory exception or stack overflow. And we'll get to that when we reach there. When do we have these kind of exceptions? And when, you know, allocate memory, you have to revoke it, right? Like you have to reclaim the memory because you don't have infinite memory. You have a limited set of memory and you need to make sure that whatever is not used is reclaimed. And we'll talk in depth about garbage collection. What, how does it work? What are the different types of garbage collection algorithms? What are the tuning parameters? What are the different types of garbage collection itself? And you know, how you can use the one that works for you. That's a really deep topic that we can talk for a long time. So it definitely deserves a separate episode. But yes, JVM does it for you. For most cases, the default setting would just work. For some cases, you have to tune it. And for some cases, you need to really be, consider how you can minimize the GC cycles, how you can minimize the allocations. And these are the cases where you're really working with high performance, low latency applications with stringent memory and CPU uh, requirements. And like, for example, the one BRC challenge, right? Every allocation will require some GC and you want to avoid that. So your code runs faster. It gets more CPU cycle. It doesn't have to share the CPU with garbage collection processes and so on. So there's a lot to talk about, but we'll get back to that later. Now, program execution is another extremely important topic because we need to understand how concurrency is supported, how program executes and what are the optimizations that can be done to make sure that our code is performant, our code is optimized, our code is doing what it needs to do in the right manner. And concurrency support, as I said, JVM concurrency is best in class, or let's say one of the best in class. And also combined with the type of abstractions it provide, provides you, I think it's really powerful for most applications. And for most developers, it's easy to get into the world of concurrency and understand these concepts. And we will get to that. There's, there's so much to talk about concurrency itself, like the threads and the different types of data structures, lock-free data structures, concurrent data structures when it comes to lists and maps and queues and all those uh, kind of things, atomic operations and volatile. There is, there's so much support. How do you create threads, executor service, futures and async computation and all of that. So it, it probably it's worth more than one episode, we'll, but we'll cover that in later episodes. Now, let's talk briefly about the runtime data area. I've said it multiple times already that the, the computing machine has some instruction sets and it tries to manipulate some runtime data areas. And why it is called runtime? Because it is used at the runtime. And these are the types of different types or classes of runtime areas that the JVM supports. The most popular one is probably the heap. Everyone working with JVM or even not work with JVM, but they, they would be aware of the heap memory. Same is with the, the stack memory, like how a stack is maintained, what exactly the, does a stack store and how does it work? How does the push and pop operations work and what exactly is pushed, what exactly is popped and how does it help a thread to make sense of the current program execution or the current instruction set. We have native method stack because as I said, you can call native uh, functions or methods from your Java application or when I say Java application, anything that is running on the JVM. We have those stacks, we have runtime constant pools and we have PC register, which is the program counter register. And we will get to that in later episodes. So for now, I think this is the basic overview. Now, for now, I think this is a good basic overview for the JVM internals or rather understanding the JVM internals because this is more like a revision or a recap of what exactly the JVM is, how does it work at a very, very high level and the, some of the terminologies that we are going to use in the coming episodes. So thank you for watching. I will add some important links for you all in the description. And so you can refer to that. I definitely recommend reading at least some parts of the JVM specification because that gives you a good understanding of what we are going to talk about in the next set of episodes. So thanks for watching and please share it. More people can watch it, more people can subscribe and more people can join our membership. So this channel can grow and I can create more such videos and continue doing this work. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.